What's going on, guys? Welcome back to Clocks on the Stove. Your usual host, myself, Grayson Fisher. With me, we have Mr. Zachariah Douglas Watts. Um, this is our second attempt at this pod. We had some technical difficulties, so we're back. Episode 97. Um, talking some UFC 292, man. UFC Baston. Uh, mm. Bantamweight World Championship of the World is on the line, as well as the Women's Strawweight Championship of the World. A card that started off very promising and then due to injuries has became pretty mediocre. And I am not a Sean Strickland, excuse me, Sean O'Malley dick rider, but it's pretty fair to say that he's the only reason this card's kept relevancy. Um, we're going to talk about the five main card fights, but first, Mr. Zach Watts wants to dive into one of the prelim fights. Yeah, so... Really, this is more of just a shout out for his return. This guy had a pretty gruesome injury earlier in his career. Uh, Chris Weidman, and when I say earlier in his career, I just mean like what last year he spent like, like two years ago. Yeah, two years ago, he spent a long time away from fighting up in the up until this point. But it is the man, Chris Weidman. Uh, if you don't know about the injury, uh, I wouldn't look it up. It's not a pretty sight. Um, pretty bad fracture to his leg, sidelined him for a while. Um, he returns against Brad Tavares. Here's my only problem. I do like that he's coming back on a prelim card. They're not really throwing him back out there like the name that he used to be because, honestly, fighting has a very high turnover rate. It's kind of hard to keep guys um, around that long, especially when you've taken this much time off. I think another thing that I want to address is his slight delusions. Um, but I am a believer that if there is delusions, there is hope. So I'm glad he is a hopeful man. But at the same time, this dude still thinks that he is a contender in the UFC. The only problem is we have a new generation of fighters. And um, isn't he 39? Yeah. So he's going to have probably a rude awakening in his return against Brad Tavares. I do think it's a good tune-up fight if he is better than when what he was. But I just think this is a new level. Like the guys we have in the UFC now are just kind of only getting bigger and better than they were in years past. Well, I say bigger, but the weight costs are still the same. But you get what I mean. Um for Weidman's sake, you know, it's not to say that his fighting style isn't going to translate well. Like, he's always been, like, a quality fighter. My only problem is, is I just don't think he's got the gas tank or the reflexes anymore that's going to keep him there. And, you know, you do wear down with fight experience. Like, if he's been out of the game this long, you don't know how he's going to be with that ring rust, which I do firmly believe is a thing. So, I don't have the high expectations for him. I am a bit of a pessimist in this sake, but I do want to shout him out. He is fighting on this card which doesn't make up for the just lackluster names we have on this prelim and early prelims. It just gives you no reason to tune in other than for the main event. But I mean, I hey. a, um, uh, so Chris Wyman is going to be baptized by Brad Tavares. He's going to get knocked out probably in the first round. Um, but I do think Chris Wyman's a hall of famer. He's dude. I mean, look at the guys he's beaten. Alessio Sakara, Tom Lawler, Damian Meyer, Mark Munoz, Anderson Silva twice, Leota Machida, Vitor Belfort. Kelvin Gaslam, he's being good guys, but he's two and six in his last eight. He's not, he's not in anymore. He needs this guy should have been retired. Um, but he's a legend. I mean, his defeat of Anderson Silva is what started the Anderson Silva de derailing, which will be known forever. Like no one thought in their right mind he was going to win that fight. I'm a big fan. I think he's awesome. I just think it's it's his time, and it sucks to say that, but like you need to know when when to when to leave. Um, I will say one story real quick before we get move on past this card. If I had to pick, somebody sat me down, like, what's your most memorable, like, overall experience from an MMA card? Like, not being at one, just, like, in general that you'll never forget. I'm going to have to go with Chris Weidman versus Anderson Silva, too. And my reason for that is Chris Weidman knocks him out in the first fight. Everyone's like, Anderson Silva is – playing around too much. He didn't keep it seriously. Chris Weidman got lucky and caught him, right? So this whole second fight, the buildup for it is like the UFC kind of wants Anderson to win because he was the go at the time. They're like, Anderson Silva's going to come back, show his revenge, prove his dominance. It's going to humble him and it's going to make him, you know, get hungry again. And they're kind of just like pushing Chris Weidman off to the side, this whole buildup for this fight. At the same time that's happening, American sniper, or actually not American sniper, lone survivor is being dropped. So Lone Survivor was the number one sponsor for this exact card. So the whole time, 
all you're seeing when you're seeing trailers or like uh, TV commercials or anything marketing wise for this card, you're just seeing the Brazil's Anderson Silva is going to rise again. And then it's like Chris Weidman training with like USA flags behind him and his USA wrestling tattoo. And then the next scene is Lone Survivor trailer. Mm-hmm. And it's just like America, America, America. And I remember right before the walkout for the main event, they brought out, I'm, I'm such a horrible American for not remembering this guy's name. Um, L- Latrell, um, is it, it's not Kyle, something Latrell, that's the main guy, that, that is like the, the lone survivor. He, they have him and they do an interview with him and he's talked about like how prideful he is to America and they're doing all this stuff and he's talking about the movie and then Anderson Silva walks out and then Chris Widener walks out with the USA flag and it's just fucking, I won't back down. Marcus then, Latrell, that's what, that's Marcus Latrell, yes. Then Chris Wyman walks out with the USA flag. Uh, to, to, I won't back down. Goes out there. And, yes, the leg injury happened, but he dogged Anderson in the first round. And it was just like a super, like, awesome American sport moment. Like, this whole buildup was that he should have never beaten Anderson Silva. Chris Wyman isn't shit. And then the whole buildup for the fight, they're doing this, like, Brazil versus USA, like, fucking build. And at the same time, it's the promoting lone survivor. So you're just like, let's fucking go. You know what I mean? But – I will admit that's a moment that that's like a whole like build up for a card. I'll never forget. I'll never forget that. But yeah. Chris Weidman will get his ass beat on Saturday. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a little past his time. Yeah. At, <laughs> it's time to put down old yeller. But I mean, we've talked about it before. There are just some guys uh, in combat sports where if you've been doing martial arts your entire life, that's all you really know. It's really kind of hard to put it behind you because you don't really know what's next for you in life. So if there's that, if there's that little voice in the back of your head that's telling you like you still got it or you still have something to prove by all means, you're going to follow it. You're going to get, you're going to give the sport everything you have because it's pretty much given you everything you've had. So I don't blame Chris Weidman for stepping back into the octagon. He kind of feels like he has something to prove given the injury he had. However, I just kind of wish he would have stepped away. The injury should have been his Joe Theismann. It should have been like, yeah. look, <laughs> we understand you're great, but Lawrence Taylor fucked your shit, dog. Like it, it's over. It, it's over. Like there, there ain't no coming back from that. And if it happens again, God forbid. Like I hope he doesn't throw. Every time he throws a leg kick in this fight, I'm probably gonna like just flinch out of terror. I'm just gonna be like, you think he's gonna throw it? Yes. <laughs> Actually, let me let me let me do a little research. What are the over under on leg kicks for uh, Chris Weidman? Yeah, look that up. While you do that, I'm gonna dive us into our our main card. Our opening fight is Marlon Cheeto Vera coming in at 28 and one, fighting Pedro Munoz coming in at 20 and seven. Two guys to me that are ex- extremely similar with their records. They've both been top level guys. Both have lost close fights to top level guys, but they constantly stay in that eight to ten mix where they're always battling good guys. They're never taking shitty fights. They're always entertaining. They're always in the fight. Pedro Munoz taking this on short notice because he's a fucking dog. Henry Cejudo is supposed to take the fight. He got injured. No disrespect to Cejudo. Just praising Pedro Munoz. Traded them for a year. Super awesome guy. I'm also a huge Marlon uh, Cheeto Vera uh, dick rider. So this is a really hard fight for me to watch because I fucking love both of them. Um. Cheeto Vera is more powerful, but I would say Pedro is more technical. He's more well-rounded. Um, I see this fight going two ways. I see Marlon's going to go out there and just put him on blast and just kill him with kicks and power shots. Or we're going to see Pedro somewhat emulate what Corey Sanhagen did and just up the volume, not really try to finish Pedro, but just try to hit him with a hundred strikes around. You know what I mean? Just, Throw everything you have at him. Keep the fight going. Boom, 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 boom. Keep it fast paced. Keep a lot going. Because as we've seen in, in Pedro's, in, excuse me, in Cheeto's loss versus Sanhagen, um, he had another loss, I think. I want to double check before I say anything. Yeah, Jose Aldo and um, Sanhagen, they both hit him with a lot of volume. That's how you beat him in this fight. Um, I think it's going to be a barn burner. I think it's going to be a great fight. You don't really see either one of these guys get knocked out. Actually, I don't know if you've ever seen either one of these guys get knocked out. Yeah, neither one of them have been knocked out. Neither one neither one of them have been finished. So it's going to be a good fight. They're both barn burners. This is the deepest weight class in the UFC. Um, it does suck, though, because, like, 
the winner of it maybe gets one more chance. Like maybe the loser cements themselves as a gatekeeper. Great fight to open up the card, though, in my opinion. If I had to pick, put all my bias, put my fandom away for both guys, I'm gonna go with Cheeto just because of the age 36 of Pedro. He's been in a bunch of wars. He also doesn't really have like a strategy. He's kind of the guy that goes out there and just hopes to like fight you. If Cheeto comes out slow, he might be fucked. But if Cheeto can win the first round, I think he wins it 30-27 UD. But I think it's going to be a good fight regardless. But it's going to go to decision. If I had to put a bet if I had to put a bet on it, I would bet the fight goes to decision. Yeah. I'm on the same wavelength as you, although I don't agree with Marlon Bear coming out hot. The every card I've ever watched with Cheeto, it he just comes out slow. And it's not to say that he's not ready or he's like just not as active in the first round. It's more so like he tries to get a feel for his opponent in the first round a lot more than any other fighter. He rarely changes from that like mindset. He's always just to kind of feel it out. He's willing to lose the first round in order to win the next two, which by all means, if you're successful in that manner, go for it. I'm not the biggest fan of it per se, because in any three round fight, I don't think you should be wasting time. Um, I just feel five, like it's five's a little different. Five's a little different, but, you know, in a three-round scenario, especially with how judges have been, you really don't know what's going to happen. Um, and especially if something happens in that second round, like, your whole game plan could be thrown out the window. However, Cheeto is 28-1, so dude obviously is doing something right in his career. Like, he obviously knows how to win. The only thing I don't really like about the whole, like, buildup for this fight, and it's kind of what's hurting the card as well. It's like their press conferences just aren't doing well, and it's really so on the journalistic standards that they just have. I've never seen so many questions, like, towards Marlon Vera and Pedro Munoz, where they're just asking him about Sean O'Malley. Like, oh, yeah, you both oh, you guys- yeah, you're right. Yeah, I've tried to both fought him. Yeah, they're like, oh, uh, both you guys have fought uh, Sean O'Malley. What do you think? And then Pedro's out there on the mic just being like, yeah, I want to beat his ass in the hotel. Like, what the fuck does that have to do with the guy you're fighting? Yeah this weekend like what what does that have to do why it are we once, it uh, once again just goes to my statement that sean's the only reason this card's alive like they're like, even on fights that aren't involving sean they're involving sean yeah it's literally just like how do we how do we make this about sean and and the fact that it's in boston just kind of like makes it even weirder because what what connection does sean have to boston yeah yeah he's from or, or or West Coast. yeah it's literally the only person that has any connection to this fight is the guy who thinks he's carrying the card, and it's Ian Gary. I'm well, I mean, what... I guess you could say O'Malley is like Irish, right? They're, it... re- they're reaching. They're reaching. <laughs> they're reaching. It's a bit of a reach. You're like, white guy. Like, l- likes to throw hands. Got to be from Boston. Yeah, he's got <laughs> Hey, I know an O'Malley man. There's an O'Malley in my neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they see the O. They see the O in his name, and they're like, "Holy shit!" They're like, "The Boston, <laughs> the Boston people are gonna love it. They're gonna eat it up like clam chowder. They're just gonna sit there yeah. and be like, fucking this O'Malley guy. He's he's yeah. a Bostonian. No, the fuck, he's not. No one, no one can. Dude fights out of Arizona. Yeah, he's literally from the West Coast. Yeah. Oh God. But yeah, I mean, other than that, fight, I don't really care. You you brought up. The next fight right after that, I don't know why this even starts. Who are you taking, though, real quick? Who are you taking in this in this fight? I'm going to go Marlon Vera. I just think more tools at his disposal to win the fight. Um, I do want to kind of look up, though. Um, I'm just going to have all the betting odds up. DraftKings, what is it, Marlon Vera versus? Uh, Pedro Munoz. Just look up the card. They should have the whole card up there. Also, I still think it's insane that, that um, mobile gambling is illegal in Florida. They're gonna they're gonna bring I think they're taking it to don't quote me on this because I'm terrible with our judicial system and how they end up passing things or not. But I, I believe within the you can smoke weed and you can le- constitutionally carry a gun. But God forbid you bet on the UFC fight, man. God forbid. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see um round method betting. Um to go the yeah. Yeah, I think everyone and their mother knows uh, how this fight's going to end up. Yeah. Literally every single odds on this card is like plus 2,500, plus 35, plus 45. And then you have a go to go the distance, minus 300. <laughs> yeah. So, like, it's just, yeah, they don't get finished. They finish yeah. people, but they don't, they, them two don't get finished. Yeah. Marlon Vera to win by decision, though, is minus 105. I think that's the best way um, 
to take this. Let me see if there's any way. See, he's. I know he's going to win by decision, but they have like weirder props, like by split decision, because do I think one judge is going to be. Okay, fight to be won by split or majority to, majority decision plus 350. Plus 350. Yeah, I'd take that. Yeah, I would take that any day of the week. I think that's the best thing to throw on this. So I'll kind of just take a note of that. Um, Marlon Vera. I'll take Marlon Vera to win by split or majority decision. Yeah. Yeah, I like that too. Uh, you were talking about diving into our next card. So I'll start us off real quick. We got Damon, Black, Damon, Damon, I don't know, Blackshear, uh, Bantamweight fight between Mario Batista. Super weird fight to have on the main card. Um, don't really know too much about either guy. I know a little bit about uh, Batista. I don't know much about uh, Blackshear. I mean, it's just like, it's a weird fight. It's a weird fight. I mean, I really don't have much to say. I mean, it is cool out of uh, Blackshear's 14 wins, 11 of them are finished. Uh, for Batista, out of his 12 wins, nine of them are finished. So these are guys that are going to definitely get it done. Um Another thing that's pretty cool too, Zach, is they're huge, five ten and five nine at bantamweight. That's those are that's a those are big ass bantamweights. Yeah, um, I'm gonna be honest. I really don't know what's gonna happen. They're like very identical. I'm gonna go with Batista just because he's on a five fight win streak right now or a four fight win streak. Let me triple check that. He's on a four fight win streak. Three of them being submissions in the first round. Damn. Um, yeah, it's just it's weird to me that that one. There's three bantamweight fights on the main card. You usually you, they usually try to not even make two of the same weight class on the main card, but three is crazy. Um, and also, you'd think they would have done a better fight. Like no disrespect whatsoever to Blackshear, no disrespect to Batista. They're both dogs. Um, but it's just a little weird to be like, you, you know, this is the the second fight on what was supposed to be one of the biggest pay per views of the year. I don't really know what's gonna happen. I'm just gonna take. I'm gonna just go with uh, you know, the safe pick. I'm gonna go. Batista's gonna win this fight. Interesting. Um, yeah, I don't really know too much about it. I know they've thrown Blackshear on a lot of majority main cards for like UFC fight nights, just because he's not a big name draw. He does tend to put on a show, like you said. Most of his fights do end up winning by TKO or KO, so he does get a lot of finishes, which is good for audience engagement. You know, it helps to post highlights and whatnot. Um, yeah, between the two of them, there's 15 submissions. Not bad. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's good just to give the fans something to see, like, hey, like this fight isn't going to go go the distance. You're going to see someone get finished. So, not a bad mindset. I do like how you brought up that we have a lot of bantam weights in Boston. Um, that that's just, that's just what they should have nicknamed the card. The Boston bantam weights. The Boston bantam weight because. You know, my mindset is they were just filling out the card and they're like, what's like our general audience in Boston where like everyone's short, every, every, everyone, everyone's short as shit. You're going to get a lot of fucking shit for this bond. I mean, I don't care. Like, I love all Boston sports. So like, I don't really mind. I like, I, I could say a lot worse about Boston people, but when I went to Boston, by the way, first of all, there's a Dunkin' Donuts on every street every corner, street, yeah. every street corner. Um, Don't know why that is. I wish I could tell you it's just like the Dunkin Donuts capital of the world beats me um but like there's nothing really like memorable memorable about the people like everyone everyone's just Irish or just like and the bald most... there's a shit ton of bald people in Boston yeah yeah a lot, a lot of fuck what are those hats called what are the what the fuck oh, what... I didn't talk about <laughs> <laughs> what are they wearing the big blinders what the yeah, fuck is it? yeah yeah, cover their bald head. Yeah, they should have just added a lot more bald fighters. I feel I feel like that would have that would have really garnered to the public there. They'd be like, hey, that guy's bald. I like that guy. He's got to be from Boston. Yeah, they added Cheeto on it. Cheeto's kind of bald. So they were like, oh, that, that'll work. Yeah, he's like, he's bald enough. Um, they're like, I'm just trying to think like what the mindset was when they built this card. I don't really care about this fight, as you can tell, because I'm not talking about it. Um, take your winner. We'll move on to the next fight. Yeah, I'm going to go with the monster, uh, DeMond Blackshear. Um, I just heard his name a little bit more, so I'm just going to lean towards him. So our next fight is probably the only somewhat kind of Boston thing in, in this. We have a welterweight fight between Neil Magny and Ian Gary. Ian Gary is coming in at a minus 490. This fight was supposed to be Jeff Neal versus Ian Gary. Ian Gary is Irish, so that is probably like the only like 
somewhat Boston thing they have. Um, but sorry, the light is burning my eyeballs. But um, even he's not like Boston. Um, Jeff Neal got hurt. I think he had a rib injury pulled out of this fight. I was really looking forward to that because that would have been Ian Gary's first like real test. D Rod was a good test for him, but like G- Jeff Neal is a top ten fighter. You know, like that would have been like, all right, is Ian Gary legit or not? Um, Ian Gary is also walking around town posting pictures with of a t-shirt that he was wearing of Jeff Neal's mug shot, and Jeff Neal didn't like that too much. Um, I also think Jeff Neal's a bad motherfucker. Watch his fight with uh uh Ravkot, Shavkot. Uh they went to war, but it is what it is. Neil Ma- shout out Neil Magny for taking this fight on short notice. But I think Ian Gary is gonna go in there and and, and destroy him personally. Yeah. I, I do agree with your statement. I really wish this would have been Ian Gary versus Jeff Neal. You know, Jeff Neal is such a weird fighter because there's sometimes he comes out and he he looks like a legitimate number one contender when he fights. And it's just like, holy shit, how is this guy not fighting on main events every single night or every other weekend? And then he sometimes comes out and it's just like, I kind of get it now where this guy stands. Whereas Neil Magny is kind of just the guy Shout out the Haitian sensation, but you just kind of like throw them out there and you're like, hey man, put on a show. Like just- now, now the, the credit I will give uh Neil Magny though is that he will fight anybody at any time. If you throw him a contract, he'll sign it and fight. Yeah. I give him that respect 100 percent Yeah. And honestly, this does no harm for Neil Magny. You, you know, you're taking this on late notice. You're probably gonna get pretty good pay-per-view buys buys just because you're fighting Ian Gary in this sense. And not to mention, if you beat Ian Gary, you're you're stopping a hype train that's really going to kind of put you on the map a little bit, or at least put you back on that. It's kind of kind of garner a little more respect towards your name. So, you know, if you want to be this guy's like real test, you know, no disrespect to D Rod, who's great, but you know, the train we're kind of at with Ian Gary is kind of like we're supposed to be giving him better and better fighters. So, you know, Maggie, you kind of got to be the guy to either stop him in his tracks or he's going to plow right through you. Like that, that those are the only two outcomes here. Unfortunately, this isn't Boston, and I like I, I don't think Ian Gary's gonna lose. I, I don't think matter so. of fact, the if I had, ways, if maybe Neil Magny can get him down and submit him, but I don't think he's gonna I don't think he's gonna. Yeah, no. Nah. Um let me look at some of the winning men. So Ian Gary to win by KO, TKO, or DQ is plus one hundred. I think that's the best way to go right now. I don't know how many of Ian Gary's fights he's won by knockout or TKO, but I he's twelve and zero, and eight of them are finishes, seven of them knockouts. Yeah, so I, you know, when I see Neil Magny, he likes to stand and bang too. He likes to throw the hands around. I think Ian Gary is a little bit better on the feet, and his reach advantage is definitely going to play a part in this as well. So you know, I could probably see like a second, third round Ian Gary. You know, I'm leaning more towards a second round Ian Gary win. By KO or TKO. Uh, yeah, I don't think he's going to starch Magni in the opening round. Yeah, no, 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 no. It's definitely going to be like, feel it out, get the crowd buzzing. He's going to do what he has to do. And in the second round, he's just going to wait for an opening and he's going to take advantage of it. So, you know, Ian Gary to win by KO or TKO plus 100. I think that's the safest bet to win some money on. So I'll take that down. Yeah, uh, the only way if I had to like make an argument for Neil Magni is Ian Gary does have, he's young, he's 25, he's our age. He has the habit of sometimes put himself in poor decisions because he sees the firefight and he, he likes it. And that's caused him to get dropped a couple of times. Mm. If Neil Magny drops him and takes him down, it's going to be a long night. Neil Magny is a very good ground game. So yeah. I just don't know if that will happen. I, don't, I doubt it will. Um, but I could see that's the only way, if I, like I said, if I had to argue for Neil Magny, that's what I would argue. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just don't see it going any other way, especially with how the – because. You can tell by the way they match make cards. They have an idea in mind of how they want fights to play out in order to get the best results. Like there is an entertainment aspect value that they really try to focus on. There's a reason why they pick Neil Magny as a substitution. You know, they didn't go out and grab a wrestler in the division. Not to say that Neil Magny isn't primarily primarily a wrestler or that he doesn't have good ground game. But I do feel like he will play more into Ian Gary's style of kind of stand and bang with how good Ian Gary's uh, kickboxing is. By the way... Quick little note I want to bring up about Ian Gary. I don't know if you saw the video with Ian Gary and who was he sparring? 
Oh, Chris Curtis. Curtis. Yeah, Chris Curtis. And it, it goes to show you the importance of having a good sparring partner because sometimes guys are too tough for their own good. We all know that you have to be tough to be a UFC fighter, but some guys just aren't very smart about taking care of their injuries. So for those of you that didn't see the video, I'll kind of break it down for you real quick. Ian Gary and Chris Curtis were in a sparring match. Chris Curtis uh, happened to catch a little shot from Ian Gary and it may have separated his rib and it well, I did. Think, I think he went in already with a rib injury and tried to play it off. Yeah. So tries to play it off, aggravates it a little bit more, but Chris Curtis trying to be the dog that he is wants to finish out the sparring round. But Ian Gary is like, fuck that. I'll jump out of the cage right now. Like just rest. Like we know, like you got it. Like we don't need this right now. Whereas you have Kevin Gastelum and his sparring partners throwing spinning elbows, spinning elbows, yeah, um, and fracturing his face. So, um, if like it's good to have a good camp under you going into a fight, it's almost just as important well, to have. Ian good- Gary and Chris Curtis aren't even the same camp; they were cross training. Yeah. So even then, just knowing the guys you're sparring with and trying to make each other better is so important like there are so many times you will go on social media and you'll see guys do light sparring and then two minutes into light sparring some guys like oh you hit me a little hard i'm gonna unleash the most ungodly overhand right you've ever seen in your life yeah yeah so like yeah let me just ruin your fucking career yeah (laughs) oh you have a fight in three weeks i'm gonna fucking murder you right now but uh just wanted to give a quick shout out to ian gary right there just being a smart fighter and trying to build up the other fighters um, that you work with is so important and definitely is a lost art in the sport time. All right. So we're back. Had to take a little break. Um, this time wasn't technical difficulties. Um, the bowel movements just happened to hit at the right time. Um, shout out Cuban Colada. Um, it do be getting the system right. Um, I was just scrolling through my X feed. Um, that just sounds like a porn website. I'm still not going to get used to switching over from Twitter. It's kind of like the Redskins and the Commanders thing. Like, I, I'm i always going to be a Redskins kind of guy. Um, yeah, they might waiting. go back to the Redskins. They should. They should. Um, I'm a firm believer. Same thing with the Cleveland Indians. Big believer in paying homage. But anyway, as I scrolled through my feed, saw this tweet that said, this is a very, very bad look for boxing. And it was breaking per four sources with knowledge of results and paperwork I obtained. Undisputed women's 130 champion Alicia Bumgarner tested positive for banned steroid mesterolone and 712 urine tests conducted by Drug Free Sport. Three days prior to the Leonard, Leonard Dato fight, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, results came back 8 10. A lot. Now, I'm not really here to discuss the fighter or excuse me, like her herself um, as a fighter. But a lot of the takes um, in these comments were like, this is a bad take. You know, this doesn't tarnish like the legacy of boxing. It's just one fighter. First of all, it's a terrible look for a sport when you knowingly allow a fighter to compete under your name, knowing she is on steroids. Did they know though? They The results came back. And they knew, and they let the fight go on. Oh, so she fought with that inner system. They already knew. Yeah, and they just oh, now they're still wait. They're still waiting for more sources to come out. But like reporters, like I, like I don't want to like say anything. I'm not here to discuss whether or not all this happened. What I will say is this: whether or not she's innocent or guilty, she turned off all of her social media comments. That. It's usually not a good sign. Not a good sign. You really don't turn your comments off when things are going good for you, considering you are the champion of the division. But a lot of the people saying, like, this is a bad take. She's just one fighter. Oh, look at baseball, yada, yada. Look, I would agree if they didn't know she was on steroids prior to the fight. Obviously, that's not on boxing or the organization themselves. However, you let your champion compete, which, by the way, uh, I will find you the exact... They, okay, yeah. So the steroid she was on, uh, Mesterolone, sold under the brand name Proveron, among others, is an androgen and anabolic steroid, which is used to mainly treat low testosterone levels and has been used to treat male infertility. Damn, so, you, so you have a woman trying to become a unit. Um, so what what are we doing here? What what are we doing here? Don't really know. Um, it is. 
I, I don't know if this makes it any better or not. It is a um an oral steroid, so you don't. At least she wasn't, you know, doing the old needle in the needle in the ass cheek. But uh, still, I don't know, uh, enough about steroids to tell you the significance of that. Yeah, neither do I. Um, regardless, not a good. He's look. all natural, baby. Only thing I got in me is semen. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> anywho uh back to the fight at hand we're gonna get to the co-main event uh this one has a lack thereof of semen and that is zong Wei lee versus uh amanda lemos uh i'm gonna keep this short and sweet um Wei lee is going to absolutely murder this woman um and it's going to be very enjoyable um you know a lot of the times you have a lot of people out there that are saying like oh women's mma isn't enjoyable you know their fights aren't as competitive um, Wei Li is a woman who fights as if she was a man and she just doesn't know it yet. She's Mulan. She's literally Mulan. Like we were She's like a oh. bad bitch, bro. That's a yeah. bad motherfucker right there. Yeah, this, this woman could throw hands. Like if you ran into her in the club, um, you may want to watch out because she will knock you out. Uh, she's probably she's nice. 5'4, 115 pounds. And there's a video of her just lifting Francis Nagano up over her head. Yeah. And, and people are out here think Bradley Martin stands a chance against yeah. Amanda Johnson, which, by the way, for all you muscle heads out there, sure, you give anyone any minimal training, they could probably defend themselves. But if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to die, especially against someone considered the GOAT in MMA, one of the GOATs, excuse me. You know, I'm not going to I'm not here to debate the whole go argument. Regardless, he is good enough, even at his 152 pound weight. Her source, Dimitri Johnson, says he is against I'm 260 Brad Martin. If I get my hands on you, I see red type motto. Regardless, back to this co-main event. I think Wei Li is going to absolutely baptize Amanda Lemos. No disrespect to Lemos. Great fighter. Deserves the shot at the belt. There's just levels to this shit. There's levels to this shit. Yeah, and I'm sorry. There are levels, and Wei Li is probably going to knock her out. Let me look at the betting lines for this while you give your take on it, and then I'll come I, back. I mean, I, I'm pretty much the same. I think Lemos deserves it. I don't think it's a thing of deserving. I think she deserves it. But I think everyone – in the, let's address the elephant in the room, Zach. The champion is Rose Namajunas, and she got robbed in that boring-ass split decision fight versus Carlo Esparza. Then instead of giving her the rematch, she took some time off. She fights September 2nd against that French girl. And even when Wei Li beat Esparza, for anyone that hasn't watched the fight, go back and watch it. She submits her, I think, in the first round. She's not even happy when they hand her the belt because she lost a Rose twice. So she knows, like, I am not the unified champion until I get revenge on Rose. And yeah. you can say whatever you want. You can call me biased, say whatever. That's the facts. Watch the fight. After she wins, she's just like, whatever. Because she knows the truth. Yeah. The UFC – now, Lemos deserves this. Listen. And what we've seen recently with women's MMA, anything can fucking happen. We saw Amanda Nunez lose to fucking um, Juliana Pena, and we saw Valentina Jevchenko lose to Alex Alexa Grasso. Shit can happen. But it feels like the UFC wants Wei Li to whoop up on Lemos, let Rose whoop up on that French girl, and then let them fight again for the title because both of their fights were amazing. Yeah, you know They've yet to bore anybody. But obviously anything can happen. I just think Wei Li is, is just – I think Whaley and Rose are just so far above everyone else in the weight class. They're I destined for another so much better. Yeah. Like it it's kind of like the Volk and Makachev situation where they're just like the only outcome you can see is them fighting again. Like there's really like no disrespect to the rest of the people in their division. They both divisions have stacked fighters and are have quality opponents. They're just not on the level of. You need to relax because Oliveira is gonna gonna take his fucking neck. Okay, look, my heart agrees with you, but my brain. The champ has a name. Where's the belt? I'm empowered by God. I'm the enlightened one. He is so hard, bro. I love him. Yeah, the only problem is, is he's fighting a guy that uh he has to dodge AK-47 bullets. Uh, <laughs> practice. All right, practice. guys. Morning cardio. We got a. Uh... We got Umkov uh He's got a 50 Barrett cow. He's just going to be spraying rounds at you, and you have to run. So 8 a.m., we're going to swim in a 30, negative 32-degree river uh, with 40-mile-an-hour currents. Uh, we're going to swim, swim against that for two hours. You're immediately going to make your way through the river into a popular grizzly bear uh, 
breeding ground where you will fight the most alpha bear and then <laughs> where we will duct tape pieces of ribeye on your body and you have to survive <laughs> yeah rather than uh, giving you a samurai outfit we will make the you're going to be the uh barbecue samurai from rick and morty we're just going <laughs> to align you in that gear and you're just going to fight uh you're going to fight grizzly bears um then we're going to shoot at you um from undisclosed locations in the forest um and then nine nine p.m um, while you're fasting, you're going to walk through an old Civil War minefield and try not to step on any of the mines. And then you're going to go fight for the belt uh, tomorrow night. And that that's going to be your training regimen. Regardless, though, um, I don't know where I got sidetracked with that whole uh, Dagestani training regimen. But, yeah, I'm going to give uh, my betting prop for this co-main event fight. You know, I think the best thing to take is Wei Lee to win by KO or TKO in the second round, plus 550. Um, I'll, I want to give Lemos enough credit to make it out of the first. I don't think she will, but I think there's more money to be made in the second if she does. Um, so I'm just going to pray to God that Lemos holds on for a round, makes it out alive. And then Wei Lee was like, all right, I gave you the courtesy of getting to fight me for five minutes. And now you're going to run. It your definitely life. doesn't touch championship rounds. No, no. Dude. not touch championship rounds. Um, so here's how the betting line goes for knockouts. Plus 275 for Whaley to win by knockout in round one, plus 550 for round two, plus 1,000 in round three, plus 1,800 in round four, and plus 2,800 in round five. Okay. So they're pretty you much know, saying. When Izzy fought Vittori, I put like a $15 bet for him to win with fifth round submission. And it was like plus 8,000. I was like, bro, if you could just drop him and hit him with the guillotine, like just fucking jump on top of him and choke him out. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin's like, I will lose by any method other than knockout. He's like, you can choke me out. I don't care. He'll hook me regardless. But uh, let's move on to the reason why everyone's actually tuning into this pod, Zach. Our main event of the evening. Al Jermaine Sterling, Aljo Funkmaster taking on Sugar Sean O'Malley. Aljo 23-3-0, O'Malley 16-1-0. Al Jermaine Sterling is technically considered the Bantamweight GOAT, kind of, sort of. We can argue that. We cannot argue it. It is what it is. Sugar Sean, probably the biggest up-and-coming rising star in the sport. Zach, I'm going to let you start us off when you think of this, right? Yeah, um, we kind of got the tale of two stories here. You know, on one side of things, we have Aljamain Sterling, who's kind of in the midst of his prime. You know, he's art like arguably, if not the, the Bantamweight GOAT right now, considered his resume. Look, I'm not here to hold the discourse on whether or not I think he's the most enjoyable fighter to watch or whether he's the most um, agreeable personality right now in the Bantamweight division. I don't really think those pertain to me or his career at this point, it's kind of like you either love to hate me or you hate to love me. Like that's kind of the way he's on right now. And, you know, when you're at this point, I feel like if when you're at this point in your title reign, you don't really have to like show respect to anyone or kind of have to beg for like love or respect. It's kind of like, I'm the best, like I'm the best at what I do right now. And that is, and that's it. What I do know for a fact is, is that this is Al Jermaine's last fight in Bantamweight. He's yeah. already come out and said he has a 99% certainty this will be his last last fight. Um, I do think he's going to move up because the weight cuts will be easier. I also think he's trying to clear space for his teammate, Marab, uh, the Walsh Willi, to kind of take over the reins uh, from then on out, to kind of keep it in this, keep the belt in the same camp. But, you know... Look, I am, I will admit I am a Sugar Sean Dick Rider. Like there, there's no way around that. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the guy. Everything he does is just pure comedy to me. I love the way he fights. He just has some of the most creative uh, striking combinations I've seen of any fighter. Am I the type of Dick Rider to go out here and say, well, oh, we don't really know how good his ground game is. I don't care how good his ground game is. It's not as good as Aljamain Sterling. Like, let's just get that out of the way right now. It's it's not, I don't care how many grappling tournaments he goes and competes in. I don't care what he does outside or how he trains in jujitsu. He's fully aware that no one can really compete with him in the striking department, which I agree with. There's not many guys in the bandweight division. I think, that can I think the only guy that could is Corey. Yeah, Corey, that's about it. But the way we see Corey fight now, Corey even said himself, he goes, I'm going to wrestle the strikers and I'm going to strike the wrestlers. Like that, Corey's at that point in his life, he just has to fight smart. So I don't even think he would get in a bank, like a banging competition pause with uh, Corey Sanhagen. But regardless, um, I I got to be honest with myself. I just don't see Sean winning, but that's kind of how Sean's career go has gone up to this point. 
you throw him to the dogs and he may or may not get it done. Like he, like we say with all fights in MMA in combat sports, all it takes is one punch. All it takes is one punch to completely change the course of history. We've seen it with so many fights. We've seen it with GSP, Matt, Sarah, we've seen it with Juliana Pena uh, and Amanda Nunez. We've seen it with Michael Venom page and Douglas Lima. We've seen it with Chris Weidman and Anderson Silva. It's happened throughout the course of history. Things can happen. However, if you were to sit me down and say life on the line, how are you picking this fight? I'm going to pick Aljamain Sterling by submission. That's just how it's going to be. I do respect Aljamain's grappling and wrestling a lot more than Peter Yon's did. And I think Peter Yon did a great job of kind of exposing Sean's weak weaknesses. I'm not going to talk about whether Peter Yon did beat Sean O'Malley or not, because guess what? Can't rewrite history. Sean won. Get over it. Um, but I do think Aljo isn't stupid enough to think that he can beat Sean on the feet. He's not even going to get let Sean get the chance. He's going to show unrelenting pressure in his face. Sean's going to have to dance around the cage for a while, hope to get a couple shots so that he can kind of switch the tables on him. But if not, Aljo's going to grab an ankle or grab a wrist, and that, that's going to be all she broke. He's Honestly, he's going to backpack him for a round. Sean may survive, and then he's going to gas him out, and then in round two, Sean may die. Yeah, I, that's what I think, too. Um, <clears throat> before I dive into that, I just want to address this. I am a weird Sean O'Malley fan. There's times where I hate on him hard, and there's times where I'm like, fuck, I love this dude. I'm very down. If I had to pick, I'm a fan. Like, I like him. I think, you know, he didn't come from a lot. He really he really show, uh, made himself a star. He made himself very unique. And 99% of the shit he does is parody. You know, like, he's a, he's a fucking – yeah, he's, he's selling his brand. But there there is facts as well, and he hasn't beaten anybody. He's eight wins in the UFC. And the fighters uh, are a combined one in 10 in the promotion after fighting him. And seven of the eight have been cut. The only one that hasn't is Peter Yon, who's been on like a three or four fight losing streak. Yeah. Um, I agree with what you said as well. Peter Yon exposed his bad wrestling and Aljamain's wrestling is much better than Peter Yon's. Like significantly better than Peter Yon's. Um, Aljo can be knocked out though. We've seen him get fucking slept by Marlon Marias. So he can, I think it's going to be, like you said, I think it's going to be the first round. I'm going to say, let's go three minutes of it. It's not going to be on the mat. They're going to be dancing around low, little leg kicks and circling. I was just going to take him down at the very end, show his strength. Second round, he's going to drown him with pressure. He's going to take him down, back, back up. Third round, he's going to finish him. That's what I think. Does it yeah. suck? Yeah, I want to see Sean as the champ. That'd be sick. I, he just can't do it, I don't think. And I think there's other guys in the division that are better than Sean too. Um, now, do I think Sean – can't eventually get there. Absolutely, bro. He's young as shit. He's fucking, tw- what, 27, 28? Is he? He's 28. You know, he's oh, got yeah. time. Yeah, he's got so much time. I just don't think this is it for him. I, I don't. And I've met Aljamain Sterling in person, and I-, I fight at 45, and I cut a significant amount of weight to make 45, and he was bigger than me, you know? So he's going to be way bigger than Sean. You know, yeah, Sean's got, what, six, a five-inch, five, five inches on height, and – barely one inch reach but like size wise aljo's much bigger much yeah. bigger i think this i just don't there's not a, a situation or scenario that happens in this fight where it favors sean in my opinion yeah aljo via sub in the second round is plus 750 aljo via sub in the third round is plus 1000 i would throw on both of those yeah uh, i think both are worthy of throwing just throw a little bit. Yeah, just throw a little bit of money on that. It, it's well worth it. I just think it's the smart thing to do. I would, you know, the betting. So here's what they have the line at. They have the line at over under three and a half rounds. So if they're thinking it's going to at least make it to the third, you might as well say Aljo's going to win by submission in the third. Throw that plus 1,000 on there. Um, there were 100 bucks at it, bro. Yeah, third round, plus 1,000. I think a that's a worthy bet to take. Um, it's worth the risk. By the way, this brings up another talking point that I keep seeing on social media and it needs to be discussed. I do realize in the context that this tweet was brought up, I do know it's satire and it is parody. So I'm not here to feed into the trolls. I won't be directing you to what account posted it. But anyway, it initially started out by saying Dustin Poirier isn't actually elite. He's just a weight bully. Um, I'm not here to discuss that. We all know how good Dustin Poirier is. I don't need to talk about this man's career and his legacy. What I do want to talk about, though, is 
the word weight bully gets thrown around in MB or uh, in MMA the same way that stat padding gets thrown around in other major sports. Like I like look, let's be honest. There are a few stat patters in major sports. There are guys that and when it isn't crunch time or when the game's out of reach, they do things to kind of raise their stats cuz look, there's money to be made when your averages are at a certain threshold at the end of the year. It like if it's a contract year, I especially understand. Get your bag, make your money. There's no rhyme or reason for that and mma though kind of same thing there are guys that do cut a significant amount of weight in order to be bigger and stronger than other guys in their division that's not an issue though if you can make that weight consistently and you can fight at that level well, why am i gonna why am i gonna take that away from you why i personally hate the term weight bully i think uh, it's stupid i think it's stupid because you understand for them to make that weight they have to cut that weight right and that's yeah. hard as fuck it's not like they're like, it's not like I'm like, Zach, you know what? I want to go fight at 35 because I'm so much bigger. Let's just do it. No, you, that's an extra 10 pounds you have to cut. The people that are saying the word weight bully have never cut weight in their fucking life. Yeah. Yeah. Some guys cut a lot. Some guys don't. It's all personal preference. I have teammates that like to cut a lot. I have teammates that don't. It all depends on your style. It depends on your body type. There's a lot of factors that go into it. But calling someone a weight bully is complete bullshit in my opinion. Because yeah. you have to cut the weight. It's not yeah. like stat padding in basketball, which I still am not a huge fan of either, like calling it that. But where like someone else can get the rebound and just feed you shots. Like, no, you have to cut the fucking weight. And then you have to rehydrate and then fight with that significant amount of weight you've lost. Yeah. So I, I hate the term weight bully. I think it's fucking stupid. Yeah, I, I agree. And look, it's not to say that I don't have a little more respect or a level of respect for guys that can just make weight on any given weekend or show up on short notice. Look, for those guys, all credit to you. You're more than likely a journeyman in the UFC and you're just out there to fight for the fan's sake. No problem with that. But at the same time, you can't use that same argument to discredit fighters that set a certain amount of time for a fight where both fighters agree on it and then they make weight. Like, what? why is there? Why is that an issue? Like, look, I I kind of agree with the statement from Joe Rogan where, where he went to go, he went on saying, he said this in the Jared Cannonier podcast, I believe, but he wouldn't talk about how if if like weight cuts didn't exist prior to like now and you tried to introduce weight cutting now, people would think you're insane. Yeah. People, people would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like cutting 30 pounds before a fight? Like, are you out of your mind? Like, yeah. we're not going to, like, that could kill you. Like, there, there are guys out there. I wish I could take you back, but the, like in most recent memory, I'm trying to think, um, Who's the who's the bald guy? Why why can't I remember his name? Bald, white, beard. A lot of weight. Josh uh, He's white. He's bigger guy. What weight class? Josh Emmett. Josh Emmett, yeah. Yeah. His his weight cut most recently was one of the worst I've ever seen. Dude looked like he was gonna die. Look at go back and look at Connor McGregor when he used to fight at Featherweight. Dude was literally bones. But see, you need to understand that that the, the way your body is built is also a factor to this. Yeah. So I walk around probably not that much lighter than Justin Gaethje. I walk around 172 to 175. He's walking around probably 177 to 180, but he's 5'11". I'm 5'8", 5'7". So even if I made 55, my reach is so much worse versus at 45, I'm fighting guys that are 5'6", 5'7", 5'8", 5'9". His body type favors him more that he doesn't have to cut a lot of weight does that make sense yeah my body type i'm all legs and i i'm i don't go up i go more out so i'm thicker but i can't fight even though he only weighs five pounds more than me he his reach and his build works better at 55 where i'm too fucking short to fight at 55 yeah and it's another thing like certain body types it's a great point to bring up because you look at john jones and what made him so successful guys with skinny calves with that thinner calf, that's just less weight on your legs. They still have enough strength and pop compared to guys with bigger calves. Obviously, like, difference in calf muscle helps you do certain things. But for their fight style, you know, you look at Jalen Turner and the weight he's able to make. He looks big up top, slimmer lower body, helps him throw faster leg kicks, helps him with his reach advantage. Like, they use their body types to their advantage. And it's it's a whole other point in the game that people don't really talk about is – these fighters understand their bodies and what they're good at far better than anyone else. Especially once they're in the UFC, because that means they've trialed and aired with it for years. Yeah, so for people to sit there and be like, oh, this guy should move up a weight division or this guy should move down a weight division. 
You don't think they've played around with their body weight in camp and seen what they felt comfortable at before deciding on what to yeah, fight and, at? And on top of that, too, Zach, they have teammates that are in the weight class above them. They have teammates that are in the weight class below them. Like, they have a full understanding of what a body type looks like for that weight class. Exactly. And Jared Cannonier used to fight at heavyweight. This man fights at, what, 170 now? 185, yeah. 185, excuse me. You don't think he's so, – you don't think he's it's, an 80, it's an 80-pound difference. You know how much 80 pounds is? That's a lot. I don't know. I don't know what exactly is. 80 yeah, I would pounds. say it's like a it's like a teenage golden retriever. So I would say. Next draft things that weigh roughly eighty pounds. 80 pounds. <laughs> you Number know, going one. into that though, going into that though, <laughs> let's dive into our draft. Yeah, we're let's we're our draft. Um, good. Watch the card this weekend. It's gonna be fun. Um, if you're a kind of person that's like me and Zach, where if it's a huge, huge card, we have like a fight night. I wouldn't call this fight night worthy. It's not worth enough to like cancel your plans for, but it's like, if you got nothing else going on, definitely check it out for this draft. I was fucking around and I was um just, just on TikTok seeing different things. And I sent Zach a bunch of ideas and I was like, why don't we do a best highlights, you know, hoop mixtape, college football, professional football, whatever um, highlight tape. And before we dive in and pick who goes first, Zach and I made an agreement because it's only fair that neither of us can take the Tavon Austin highlight tape because that is unanimously number one. There's not a single highlight tape in the world that uh, equivalates to that. So we're just going to automatically cement that at number one, and then we're going to draft one through five for second place on. By the way, that reminds me, uh, I remember reading this, and this is just so insane to me. Um, As overpowered as Tavon Austin's highlight film is, in fantasy hockey, when you used to draft, when Wayne Gretzky was playing, you were only able to take either Wayne Gretzky's assists or goals, but you couldn't take both because whoever drafted him would outscore everyone. He single-handedly would beat teams, so you were only allowed to take one or the Gosh. other. That's how fucking good he was. Imagine if in football, you were like, you can only take Deshaun, like, or not Deshaun, excuse me, um, Jalen Hurts, like, rushing or passing. Yeah. Like, Imagine being that good at fantasy where you were just like, yeah, you can't. You, you can't you, do both. Yeah, you can't, can't do both. If you, if you have him, you 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 won, essentially. Wayne fucking Gretzky, bro. Yeah, so shout out Wayne Gretzky. Um, we will not be drafting uh, his highlight, by the way. This will primarily be only like football highlights, I think. Um, I got a couple other sports in there. You got a couple other sports? I like that. I, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to mix it up a little bit. I think I have some in mind. Um. Let me just bring up my notes. Uh, I'll let you go first since we got the um, whole Tavon Austin. All right, I'm going to go my number one. Um, obviously, these are not in order, too. These are just like how they come to my mind. I'm going to go Mac McClung's high school mixtape, high school hoop tape. Okay. Okay. We Mac McClung, baby. Okay, Mac McClung. Congrats, cousin. Um, my number one. This isn't even necessarily close. This was like my obvious number one. Uh, John Wall's high school mixtape. Uh, that was nasty too. John, John Wall literally was at like John Wall definitely had he was a man. He was a man amongst had, children. He had like twenty girls at his game that he was showing out for every single time. Um, and it wasn't even close. Like this man obviously had bitches to get after the game. Um, <laughs> and his highlight tape proves it. So like, give me give me John Wall high school mixtape. My number two, I'm gonna go uh Heisman season Lamar Jackson. Give me Heisman season Lamar Jackson. Interesting. Okay. Um, my number two, arguably one of the most underrated college football stars and highlight tapes. Give me DeAnthony Thomas from Oregon. Ooh. He never got injured. That Oregon team had an easy path to the championship Ooh. this man was a bona fide superstar yeah, his highlight tapes long as shit too <laughs> as well that was a its own documentary they had to add like eight songs to that shit just to keep yeah, that's it a good one you know. bro. damn i didn't think about that one that's a good one um damn number three just to keep it so i'm like alternating as much as i can give me zion williams high school highlight tape it's just it's like john walls and to make it better Zion went to like a little 1A private school. So he was playing against like you and me. So he's just fucking 
windmilling dropping 80 points a game. By the way, I don't know. I don't remember the dude's name, but shout out his like white point guard that always threw the best lobs. Like that was like, yeah, I know. What about that little white kid that guarded him and was talking shit? Yeah, he was like, hey, fuck you. And he's like, I'm going to windmill dump from the yeah. free line um, and you're going to die. No, do that. <laughs> do that for my, uh, for my number, uh, my number three. Nice. Um, yeah, uh, this is a good one, dude. My, I'm stuck between my, I think if I take this at three, I'll safely have this guy for four because I don't think you're thinking of him. But um, I'm going to take this guy at three, even though I think four is better. My three is going to be uh, Johnny Manziel's highlight. Yeah, that's what I was going to take. That's yeah, I, I knew to take him. I, I couldn't let him slide too far. I think my next guy is just as good, um, if not better. Probably one of my fav- favorite highlight tapes of all time. But – I'll see if you take them with this. Mine is really weird, but I just got to do it. This is four, right? Yeah. All right. Number four. Give me Barry Bonds home run highlights. Okay. Okay. I like it. Barry Bonds. It's it's literally 11 minutes long. (laughs) I'm just hitting fucking home runs, bro. Oh, fuck. Dude, Barry Bonds is the man. Yeah. I'm a big Barry Bonds guy. They're making up. You know, we just talked about Johnny Manziel. They're doing a Barry Bonds untold as well. Finally. It's coming out, I, I think, the 24th. Good. I'm glad. Um, my number four. I gotta do it. I'm gonna take Christian McCaffrey's. That's a really fucking good one. Yeah. That's what Christian really what well, Christian McCaffrey did in the Rose Bowl alone against Iowa was some of the most disrespectful football I've ever seen in my entire life. This man ran back like two punt returns and ran for like a buck eighty. And somehow didn't win the Heisman because they dick rode Derrick Henry so hard. Um, it was unbelievable. So um, that will always make me mad. So, yeah, you're going to give a guy AP Offensive Player of the Year. Or, sorry, it's yeah, not Who AP. won the Heisman over him that year? Derrick Henry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah, which was bullshit. Uh, Another yeah. big robbery one is Marcus Mariota over Melvin Gordon, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, that yeah. was another really bad one. Um, my last pick. See, the thing is, I can name big name guys and we could keep going on with this, but I have to go with one that touches my childhood. Like when I was a kid, I used to pull up on YouTube and watch. Give me Florida State LaMarcus Joyner highlights. Okay. I know it's random. I know no one else probably watched it. Give me that. I'm going to do an honorable mention if that's okay too, because I know you're not going to pick it. My all-time favorite highlight tape of all time to this day I would die if I could only watch one highlight tape for the rest of my life. You're going to give me, I think it's 2013, or I think it's 2013, it might be 2014, Michigan State defensive back, Darquez Denard. That's my absolute favorite highlight tape in the history of highlight tapes. No one really knows who he is because he was kind of a bust in the NFL, but he won the Jim Thorpe Award. Um, he beat actually LaMarcus Joyner and Justin Gilbert from Oklahoma State for the award. Dude, look, if you ever watched it, look it up. It's so hard. It's so fucking hard because they made it like documentary style kind of. But yeah, Dark West Denard to be my honorable mention. Give me number five, uh, LaMarcus Joyner. Zach, wh- wh- how are you finishing off your list? See, I have three in my mind right now, but only one can be worthy of that spot. Do I want to take him? Do I want to take him? Because the problem is, is my mine doesn't have a lot of mix to it. My Mine is... Mine's a lot of football guys, and I feel like this guy is super deserving of this fifth spot. So I don't know. Just name name your fifth, and then throw your two honorable mentions. All right, number five. Give me not his twenty fifteen MVP season, okay. but give me his college Heisman national championship. Cam Superman. That's Newton. a good one. That's a very fucking good one. Yeah, Damn, you did me. a little uh, the Anthony Thomas, Cam Newton there. Yeah, threw threw it in there. Honorable mention, rookie season, Odell Beckham. Okay, um, fire the catch. Yeah. Every, everything about that rookie season is just yeah, insane. Um, what's your other honorable mention? My other honorable mention is Larry Bird. Damn, think- that's a fucking fire one. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna go Larry Bird. Uh, do I? I love – I'm not the. I'm not that guy where, like – you know those, like, meme videos where they're like, how can you know a guy's racist? 
Austin was favorite baseball. <laughs> Austin was favorite basketball player. If, if, if you're doing two honorable mentions, I'm gonna do one more honorable mention. Give me fucking Shaquille O'Neal, bro. Okay, give fair enough. Just posterizing people. Honestly, I'll even I'll even give you that combo mixtape of where it's a uh, Kobe and Shaq. And Shaq, with- yeah, and it's just like you know the no you know the you know the photo or the video they always start off with where it, like pans from their feet up and they're just standing there with their heads down. Like you know what's funny though is is when they played together they didn't even like each other. Well, yeah, they're both like alpha dog mentality. Yeah. Kind of- like there's a there's a video of Shaq at a he's at a rap concert they bought him on stage and he starts freestyling Kobe you could kiss my ass. Rest in peace to the goat. Yeah, rest in peace to the goat. But kiss my ass. By the way, um, Shaq may be my favorite Hot Ones guest of all time. Yes, yes he's very uh, good. His his scene where he's like Kansas don't know how to make no hot wing. And then he immediately eats it. He goes, he's yeah. like, I, apo- I apologize, Kansas. I didn't. I was unfamiliar with your game. Um, but yeah, and that's wraps up everything. Episode eight, uh, 97. We're about to hit number 100. We got a very special guest coming on for number 100. Uh, UFC 292, O'Malley, Sterling, or Sterling O'Malley, UFC Boston. Zach Watts, any final words? Yeah, I feel like I had one hot take. Well, I feel like my hot take was like the weight bullying thing, but I had one more. Let me, give me like 30 seconds to see if it'll come to mind when I go to my feed. I feel like- Oh my God. Oh my God. I completely forgot about this highlight tape. Holy shit. I know. I feel like there's a really big one I'm forgetting too. It's like haunting me. Ladanian Tomlinson. Ladanian Tomlinson's a really good one. I was thinking Sammy Watkins. Ooh. Sammy Watkins at Clemson. He had a really good highlight tape, also. I agree. Um. Oh, bro, Ray Lewis. Yeah, but like anytime I think of Ray Lewis, like anytime I think of Ray Lewis, that just reminds me of when I was like twelve and thirteen, and I would just go on YouTube and I would look up biggest football hits. Yeah, right? that's exactly. And then all years. <laughs> Yeah. Here come no boom. Yeah. Like Ocho Cinco tries to hit him. He's like, I tried to block Ray. They go, how'd that go? He goes, not good. <laughs> I can't feel my knees. You got Deion Sanders up there too. Yeah, Deion and Jerry, obviously, um, legendary. Yeah, I can't think of my hot take this week. We're just gonna say my hot take was the weight bullying thing. Uh, if you if you throw the word weight bully around, I'm gonna think you're a casual. That's just how how it is. Um, sorry, not sorry. And. Oh, Blackshear's Blackshear fought last card. Is oh, that yeah, I think so. He's trying to make the fastest ever flip of wins, which would be the record right now is Hamzat with ten days, and uh, he would have seven, which would break the record. Yeah, fight fight twice in seven days. Yeah, so uh, yeah, shout out to Mon Blackshear, the monster. Shout out to him. But yeah, that'll be that'll be my closing statement on Not that. So.